What's up guys, welcome to Pounds Invested, I'm your host Stephen Georgiev. Before we get into today's video, I want to thank those of you who have viewed my other videos and have subscribed to my channel. We've known about gold for a fair old while. The first known artifacts of gold date from 4,700 years BC. That means gold's been used in its various guises for around about six and a half thousand years. But why is that? When on the face of it, it seems to have no real value, like a bag of corn or a pizza business. In fact, as legendary investor Warren Buffett once said, gold doesn't do anything except sit there and look at you. I think he might have been onto something, but let's see. So, as we can see from this chart right here, the biggest use of gold is in the jewellery industry as well as in industrial manufacturing processes. So for every phone, computer, electronic item, there's a little trace amount of gold in there. So, we know gold's useful, but does it actually make a good investment? Let's get to that now. Before we can figure out whether or not something makes a good investment, we need to know how much of it there is in the world. And gold's pretty rare. There are only 160,000 tons of it worldwide. Now, that might sound like a lot, but if you put every bar of gold ever mined next to each other, you couldn't even cover a football pitch. So given its rarity, one argument made for gold is that it's a store of value. Now, the reasoning behind this is that the supply of money is essentially infinite. A government or a central bank can decide to print as much money as they like, but you can't print gold. So the theory goes that gold is a worthwhile store of value. In fact, one adage is that 150 years ago, an ounce of gold would get you a very nice tailored suit. And even nowadays, that's true. So if an ounce of gold is worth around about 1800 US dollars, I'm sure you'll agree you get a pretty nice suit for that. So in some sense, you could perhaps argue that gold is in fact a useful store of value. But let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So one way to measure whether or not something's a store of value is to look at the relative purchasing power of that item over time. In other words, how much stuff can you buy for an ounce of gold over time? Well, gold can certainly create fortunes. During the period of 1929 to 1933, at the very height of the Great Depression, the purchasing power of an ounce of gold went up 17 times. What that means is, if in 1929, in exchange for one ounce of gold, you were able to buy one car of a particular model and type, then over the period to 1933, you were suddenly able to buy 17 cars of a particular model and type. A similar thing happened in a decade of the 1970s, again a period of considerable global uncertainty when it came to oil shocks. During the period of the 1970s, gold's purchasing power rose by 15 times. So okay, we've seen that gold can certainly make your fortune, particularly in times of economic crisis and distress, but is the opposite also true? Well, I'm afraid sadly yes it is. So in the period of 1980 to 2000, the purchasing power of gold actually dropped by 88%. What that means is let's say in 1980, you're able to exchange your one ounce of gold for 100 units of some other commodity, let's just say milkshakes. So by the year 2000, your one ounce of gold would only buy you 12 milkshakes. Now, that's not because milkshakes have suddenly become ridiculously expensive, even though they are delicious. And this period of record economic growth was brought about largely by an unlimited resource that people can tap into. What is this unlimited resource? Well, it's really simple. It's innovation. There is no limit on the amount of things that humans can come up with and make. So in that sense, John Maynard Keynes was wrong when in the 1930s, he said that by the year 2000, everything that could be invented would be invented. So what does all of this innovation mean for the relative performance of gold? Well, as you can see from this chart right here, if you'd invested a hundred pounds in a stock market in 1920, riding through the Great Depression, riding through all the ups and downs of the past 100 years, you would have made, by 2020, a 400 times increase on your investment. So your £100 wouldn't be worth £100 anymore. It would suddenly be worth £40,000. Now, let's compare that to gold. 
Well, if in 1920 you'd invested that same £100 in gold, you would have made some money, of course, admittedly, but nowhere near as much. So, if you'd invested your £100 in gold in 1920, by 2020 you would have made a 100 times return. So your £100 would now be worth £100,000, which is nice, admittedly, but it's nowhere near the 400000 that you'd have if you'd invested in the stock market in 1920. And that's even accounting for all the Great Depression and the trials and tribulations of the stock market over the past 100 years. So why is it the case that the stock markets have been able to make such impressive returns over the past 100 years? Well, as we said, there's no limit on human innovation. So when the next person comes up with a new gadget and makes a company, and then that gadget becomes a global sensation, and then that company becomes listed on the stock market, and then they come up with a new gadget to follow it, then by that point the company becomes a household name and people start to trust it. And so at that point you've given something value which previously didn't have any. And there's no limit to the amount of times we can do this. Another argument made in favour of gold is that it's less volatile in times of crisis. Well, is that the case? Sadly, it's not really, no. Perhaps the best way to measure volatility is what's called standard deviation. And what this effectively measures when applied to gold is the amount of fluctuation in the price when compared to a long-term average. What this means is that if the price of gold's indexed at 100, there's been a day in which the price of gold has been $1,700, like recently. There's also been a day in which the price of gold has been about $6 per ounce. I think you can safely agree that's quite a lot of volatility for something that doesn't really produce much. So why do some people continue to hold gold then, if we've said that it's more volatile than stocks and doesn't produce a return that equals or exceeds stocks? We must be missing something. Well, thankfully, we are. Now, there is one reason why having a little bit of gold in your portfolio can be a good thing. It works very well as a portfolio diversifier. This means that gold is indirectly correlated with other assets, such as stocks, bonds, and real estate. And so essentially, gold benefits when other markets are being jittery. So by having some gold in your portfolio, you're mitigating the risk of being caught in a particular bubble, like an equities bubble, or a real estate bubble, or a bond bubble, because you have an asset, gold, which performs differently to the asset in that bubble. So let's say you wanted to trade gold. Is there a smart way of doing it? Well, I'd argue yes, there is. So you buy gold when you get the slightest hint of an economic crisis. This is what's known as a flight to safety. So when there's an economic crisis on the cards, people tend to buy gold. People know that if the worst were to happen and the world were to end, they'd be able to trade their gold for the useful assets like corn and grain. But I think you'll agree that's being slightly alarmist. We can be fairly certain the world isn't going to end anytime soon. So if you bought gold as soon as you got a whiff of an economic crisis on the cards, how long should you hold it and when should you sell it? Well, you should sell it immediately as it turns out that things are going to be coming back to normal again. So currently, the gold price is around about $1,810 per ounce. It's an all-time high. I'd say it can't go very much higher, and so perhaps now might be a good time to sell. But let's say you've decided that you want to buy gold. How do you buy it? Well, there are various ways. You can buy it in the form of coins, or in the form of bullion, but both coins and bullion carry both a dealer markup and also, of course, storage fees. A better way to buy gold is through an exchange-traded fund. What this is, is essentially a fund which tracks the performance of gold. So when the gold price appreciates, your fund investment will increase in value. When the gold price depreciates, your fund investment will decrease in value. This is better for the average investor because they don't need to worry about paying storage costs. They also don't need to worry about paying a dealer markup. It's all taken care of in the fund administration charge. So with all that said, should you have any gold in your portfolio? Well, personally, I like to have around about five to 7% of gold in my portfolio, just so I can benefit the most from diversification. 
Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please like and subscribe to my channel. In my next video, I'm going to be looking at what the best way to invest in equities is. Is it by buying individual stocks or are you better off buying a fund which contains hundreds of thousands of stocks? For that and very much more, I'll see you in my next video.